Thank you, Gail, and good morning to Liberty and all those who are joining us online this morning. It's a beautiful morning. I am, at least I thought when I was getting dressed this morning that I was breaking a rule by wearing something white after Labor Day. Um, so that's why I wore white. I thought I was breaking a rule and I was being some kind of a renegade, so I wore a white shirt today because I heard you're not supposed to wear white after Labor Day. I could be wrong on that, and that's not what today is about. I will, I will tell you this before we start and open in prayer, uh, because this leads into our, our message and our sermon. It is a true story that this past week, I had to and did, and did in fact dial 911 intentionally. And I'll get to that a little bit later, uh, and I've got that tied into this morning's serv uh, sermon and message. And because of that, let me go ahead and say, the message today is going to be tied to those numbers, 911. This past week was the 19th anniversary of 9-11. Um, so I, I, I want to include all of those families in our prayers. And so we're going to be in the book of John this morning. As you guys know, we... And it's just kind of stayed with me, so I'm going to stay with it. This, this idea of light versus dark, uh, it, it's an excellent theme, and it's one that, that John wrote about uh, in his book. So it'll be chapter 9, verses 1 through 11. This is, today is going to be the 911 or 9-11 service that we're going to have. So before we do anything else, the first thing we need to do is to go to the Lord in prayer. If y'all will bow your heads with me. Father, we're in fellowship, and we're thankful for that because many are not. It is a blessing that we are able to be physically in fellowship here on the campus at Liberty. We thank you for that. It's also a blessing that through today's technology, we're able to be in fellowship with one another just over the bandwidth of the Internet. It's, uh, who knows where we'd be if this technology was with us back in the 50s or the 60s, but we have it now, and we know you have a plan for it, so we're using it. We want to thank you for just being able to be in a country where we can freely assemble, where we can do this, where we can fellowship and learn about you, where we can come to church on Sunday morning and worship you, God. We thank you that we live in a place that we can do that. Father, this past week, we remembered all those who had fallen and those of us who were living at the time 19 years ago, we can all remember exactly where we were when that news started coming that Tuesday morning. Father, there's still a lot of suffering families. Many fell. Many died trying to save others, trying to do your work. We want to lift them up and commemorate today's service to all those who fell, who gave their lives, to the families that are still living but still suffering because of what happened that day on September 11th, 19 years ago. We want to lift them up to you this morning. I want to lift today's congregation up to you. Lift myself my words, those that will be saying today, and lift all our prayers up to you and put them in your hands because you are the potter and we're just making ourselves the clay today, Lord. Thank you. And thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And it was your son, Jesus, who when the disciples asked him, Jesus, if we're going to pray, tell us how we're supposed to do it. Jesus responded to him, with the Lord's Prayer. So we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together in honor of the best teacher that's ever been on this earth who taught us to pray, saying these words together. And please join me. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. A few announcements this morning. Uh, first, uh, before I forget, because this was a, a write-in <laughs> after uh, Tom had everything typed up, Melvin let me know this morning. If y'all will remember, we voted several, several weeks ago to continue our services outside until the Sunday following Labor Day. And today is the Sunday following Labor Day. So when we're done, if you can and you are able, please stick around because the congregation needs to decide where we're going from this Sunday forward. This was the, the end date of the vote. So there needs to be another vote in one direction or another. So please stick around for that as we tend to that church business. Um, contingent upon that, uh, we will continue meeting outside in the picnic area until further notice. Our services begin at 10 a.m. <clears throat> we invite all those who are listening and not able to be here to come join us. Bring your lawn chair, bring your cooler. I will not check to see what's in it. Uh, social distancing will be practiced. Masks are optional so long as we're outside. The adult Sunday school class um, has been suspended temporarily uh, until we know really in the future when we're going to resume meeting inside. I want to congratulate uh, Roger and Deborah on their new granddaughter. Ivy Elizabeth, congratulations, who was born last Tuesday. And going on to what we were talking about before we started recording, Deborah was one of the ones, she's, she's a lay speaker, and uh, she was the first one I called because I wanted to have, if anybody was going to cover that service, I wanted it to be somebody from our inner flock if, if we could. And Deborah was like, Chris, golly, I, I would love to, I, and I really want to. But this was coming down the line for them. And it wasn't that she was necessarily had to be there for the, she wanted to be, but the reason she couldn't handle the service wasn't because the, the birth of her granddaughter, but she and Roger were the first line in defense to care for Luke once that baby came. So, and, and it was needed. And I told Deborah, I said, if you want to be sure that that baby is born either on Sunday or so close that you can't do it, then commit to preaching on Sunday and that baby will, and you didn't even have to do that and, uh -huh. and your granddaughter came so congratulations that you want to talk about miracles y'all know this but it's it's worth saying that's that's one of the things that tells me every single time there is a God that life and soul can be breathed in to this construction of cells that a human being lives. I mean, that's that's proof there is a God. Um, so that's special. There will be a special offering next Sunday for uh, Well Root, W-E-L-L-R-O-O-T. That's for the Methodist Children's Home. Offering envelopes are on the table up here by the collection basket. You can use these envelopes and make checks payable to Liberty, UMC. DD will consolidate everything and make one check to Well Root. Uh, the Liberty Church website materials in the hands of the website developer. I ex I'm going to call him this week and see where we are on that. That, that should be any day that that's uploaded because it's been a couple of weeks since I confirmed with him that they had received everything from Larry, which, by the way, I see Larry here. Good to see you. The last time I was actually here, you were in Atlanta in the hospital. So um, very good to see you. Very good to see you here. Um, continue to pray for America as we move forward to and through Election Day. If you have any announcements, send those to Larry Davis. Uh, at And you can call the church phone number, which will roll over to his as well. Continue to pray uh, for an end to this COVID-19 pandemic that we're experiencing. And really, the, the all the things around it, the, the people that are out of work, the businesses that have shut down. We One thing we learned after 19 years coming after 9-11 is that our lives were never the same after that event and they never will be um, you didn't used to have to take your boots off and your belt off going through the uh, airport in Atlanta and that's just one of them same thing with this pandemic whether it's good or bad life as we know it will be forever changed I don't I don't hope this I'm 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 really reluctant to think that restaurants will be the same as they were before this thing hit. And many of those businesses that own these uh, corporate restaurants and even 
even the locally owned ones um, are, are going under. So it, it's affecting a lot of people other than infecting them with illness. Uh, so, so keep all those in your prayer as well. Keep our dear friend Larry in your prayers. Um, this coming Tuesday is when you're going to have the pacemaker installed. Is that it? Uh, so uh, pray for that procedure. Actually, pray for the doctors. Uh, and pray for his wife. <laughs> she needs those prayers too. Absolutely. And for those of you who couldn't hear, Larry was just thanking the Liberty community for the, the outreach and all of the things that, and, and prayers that were sent to him in his home and how touched he was for that. Um, keep Chuck Adair in your prayers, Denise Bickers, Lois Leach, and Ann and Richard Smith. Are there any other announcements, uh, causes for celebrate? Yes. That was, that's our newest member, Mr. Peavy, who, <coughs> who, excuse me, just had knee replacement surgery, thanking the Liberty community for all the, the prayers and cards and out, outreach as well. Um, good to see you back and moving around uh, with all that. We hope that goes well with you. Um, I've, got, I've got one, I was thinking about this morning, one cause for celebration, um, one, a prayer that was answered. Uh, that I want to share. Um, about 13 months ago, uh, last August, before I, I started here with you guys, um, I witnessed something that no father or parent should ever have to with their child. The very last football practice of the entire summer in camp that happened last year at Gatewood, before they began their first game the next day, after all that work, I got called and camp was happening in the morning a little after 7 a.m. Uh, to rush over there and I, I couldn't even see where my child was on the practice field because of the ambulances and they had already removed the team back off the field because it was so gruesome. But to see my child, Cam, laying face down and his left leg totally detached from his body except for the skin that was holding it in place and flopped in a direction that was would make a stomach turn was one of the worst memories I'll ever have and I even had to when I knelt down with my son I had to turn my back to his leg because I couldn't stand to look at it and as I followed that ambulance all the way to Macon and and praying I hope no one has to to think the thoughts that I had to think about what could happen. Fast forward to this past Friday. I just want to give glory to God in stating that I was able not only to see my son play the game of football, but he started as the right offensive tackle and he started as the left defensive tackle and they won 35 to nothing. Even if they had lost, be, being able to see my prayers answered by God, it took a long time, but to see my child healthy again and competing um, was really humbling just a couple of days ago. And that's a celebration for both me and my wife, not so much for my daughters. I think they like seeing Cam in pain and suffering. Uh, but, not, but his mother and I, I remember praying in that chapel at the hospital because you don't know at the time, we didn't know if it was a broken femur. Uh, it was a dislocated hip. His, I mean, his entire leg bone came out of the hip socket is what happened. Um, and that doesn't look right at all. Uh, but it, 
you know, nothing was broken. He is 100% healed. And uh, when you see your child like that, all of the bad thoughts that could happen go through your head. But God put those at ease. And I, I, I'm thankful that I was at a place in my life with God where I knew, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I could put this situation in his hands and he was going to lift that burden from me and my family. And he did it. Uh, so that, that's a celebration that we had. And because my prayer was answered, I want to publicly state it works. Pray and God will answer your prayers. It happens. Um, if there are no other announcements, well, we do have one other announcement. Gail is going to be singing after um, we're going to do our Apostles' Creed in just a moment um, and then have time for our tithes and offerings. And after we finish with our tithes and offerings, Gail is going to sing for us, He Leads Me Every Step of the Way. So those of you who are able, even those with knee replacement, if you will stand as we join together to recite our Apostles' Creed. So I ask you as Christians this morning, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. At this time in our service, we want to take pause and give back to God what has always been His. Those of you at who are here this morning, the offering basket is up here to my right, to your left, as we give back our gifts and God's tithes, those of you at home, please send your checks to Liberty United Methodist Church. That's 3091 Liberty Church Road, White Plains, Georgia, 30678, as Gail plays our offertory music. If you'll join me in prayer as she does that. Thank you, Gail. At this time, Gail, I'll uh, ask you to come up as she shares with us, he leads me every step of the way. Gail. Chris, when you were talking about your son, I couldn't help but think of my son. Uh, I lost him when he was 16 years old in a car wreck. So, uh, when I got the news, I already knew in my heart that he was gone, but my head wouldn't accept it. So, this song, He Leads Me Each Step of the Way, is my daily walk with God because 
that's the only way you can live through a death of a child. And praise God, your child was safe. But he was, uh, Trent was a special kid and uh, still miss him to this day and just uh, pray for your children, folks. Just pray for your children. Heaven gets closer with each passing day. Though my feet may grow weary, I'll not stumble or stray, for He leads me each step of say alongside the birth of Ivy Elizabeth what you just witnessed to me is if you need it that's proof that God loves us more than we will ever know because I don't know I cannot think of a more 
painful thing to experience on this earth than as a mother or a father having to bury a child. And for that to have happened and to see what that lady just did right there tells me there is a God and His love is more powerful than we will ever, ever be able to understand. And so thank you for that. His light shone through you just then. And uh, we're the recipients of that. So if you'll turn in your Bibles with me this morning, we're in the Gospel of John, the fourth book of the New Testament, the fourth Gospel, the one that is not considered one of the synoptic Gospels. It's different in its uh, chronology and, uh, and timing of the stories than the, other, than the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we've been in the first part of uh, the book of John, but today, this morning, I want to read from chapter 9. As everything this past week just seemed to be saying, either 911 or 911, I wanted to find a place in the Bible that kind of seemed to speak to some of the events that I had experienced. And uh, I basically said, God, I'm not going to read and let the Bible tell me what, what we're going to do. It's one of those where I said, God, this is kind of where I want to go with this. It's relevant in that it's 9-11. It's on people's minds. I did have to call 911 this week. I need some 911 scripture. Uh, so I started reading different ones. Uh, Matthew, Luke, uh, I even read Romans, and I didn't go back to Romans, but Acts, Galatians. Uh, and then when I got into Galatians, and I, I got into uh, some of the uh, books of the Bible because I was I was Googling them on my phone, um, actually, and it occurred to me, you know, not all the books of the New Testament have nine chapters, Chris, so you're going to be limited. And then I came across uh, the first part of chapter nine. So... Join me as I read, read along in your Bibles, uh, the first part of chapter 9 in the book of John. I'll be going verses 1 through 11. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? This is Jesus talking. He said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with his saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like that man. But he himself insisted, I am that man. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed. And then I could see. This is the reading of God's word for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now I want to start with this. I want to give you a scene of something that happened this past week. And it should serve as a metaphor, not only for myself, but without raising your hands, I'm not going to put anyone on the spot, even those at home. I want to see just from your hearts 
how many of you experience this similar type thing? Not the actual acts themselves, but the thought process. So this past Thursday, I had to be in Macon uh, for, I went to see uh, my, uh, at the doctor's office, for, and I'm, I'm fine, this wasn't COVID tested, to be quite frank and honest with you, when, when you get into having to look at yourself on YouTube and TV, somehow it seems to just kind of come from you. You know, you should shed a few pounds. And so it was my diet doctor that I was going to see to check in, to weigh in, to do that. So I parked in the parking deck that I always park in, went to the doctor's office, and it's, you know, three floors up, but I don't take the elevator, I take the steps, and so I'm coming down the steps, and from the moment I left the hallway of the doctor's into the, the stairwell area as I'm going down the steps, <clears throat> the time frame from that automatic open door to where I went down the steps and through the door into the concrete parking garage was probably a matter of three to five seconds. However, what I'm about to try to articulate to you is what all was going through my head in that three to five seconds. I know at that time I was thinking, Lily's ball game is at four in Monticello. What time is it now? Am I, am I going to make it in time? Do I have time to go buy the sporting goods store? Why do you have to go to the sporting goods store? Well, Lily's bat's dented. Lily might need a new bat. Kim's first game is tomorrow. Surely there's something I could get for him. Did I forget to put on deodorant this morning? No, I smelled that on the way up the stairs to the doctor's office. That's not me. <clears throat> Why would people use an elevator in the first place during COVID? You're in a confined space with a whole bunch of strangers. Well, some people can't use the steps, you idiot. Oh my gosh, that lady doctor of scrubs. Don't do that. Quit looking. What's going to get you out of thinking that? Krispy Kreme donuts. I would love some Krispy Kreme donuts right now. Hot God, and if you can, if you're going to make that miracle happen, send some of my mom's pork chops right there with it and put it in my truck and I will be in heaven on this earth. I forgot to sign those orders at the office for Kelly before I left. I need to work with Lily on her swing to make her swing harder. Brandy's transporting her and three other girls who were probably screaming and having overdramatic fits in her car, and I hate that for her, and she's probably going to blame me for that. I could still use some fresh Krispy Kreme donuts. Is it going to rain today to water my garden? Is it going to fill up my rain buckets? Where's my key fob? I need to unlock the, the, the truck. Why don't I? I tell you what. Hey, do that button where it cranks up automatically. That way, the person who just pulled up in the parking place in front of you, it'll scare them and that'll be funny. No, that won't be funny. That's me. Oh, yeah, that would be funny. Mash that button. Nothing happens. Where's the key fob? Where's my truck? <coughs> it wasn't there. <laughs> dun, dun. Everything stopped. And so I frantically run, or jog, because the, the only thing that would make that really real is if I physically stood in the parking place where my truck was parked. I knew exactly where it was parked, and I could see the void. So I went and I stood in it, and my truck was stolen. So I whipped out my phone and I dialed 911. And the 911 operator, said, this is 911, how can I help you? I told her my name and where I was and that my truck had been stolen. And because it was part of the, the hospital property, she said, I have to transfer your call to the hospital police. And I said, okay, you do that. So as she transferred the call to the hospital police, I'm looking back, and about the same time that lady answered the phone and said, how can I help you, in the sweetest voice, then it dawned on me. I said, ma'am, I just called 911 to report that my truck had been stolen, and I was certain that it was halfway to Atlanta or already in a chop shop by now. 
But as that phone call was being transferred over to you, I turned and looked at the door that I just came through, and I'm on level D, and I parked my truck on level A. <laughs> so if you'll stay on the phone with me, because my heart is racing so bad, I'm still convinced that my truck is stolen, even though I'm the idiot who looked for it on the wrong floor. Will you stay with me as I go down the steps to level A? And she did. And I opened the door. And there's my truck. And she laughed. And I called myself an idiot. And she could have chimed in and said, yeah. And she goes, no. It happens to all of us. And I said, well, I'm very sorry. And you've been very kind. Now I'm going to go home. So I did dial 911. The next thing I did was call my wife and let her know what dumb thing that I had done. Because I knew that she was suffering with three 12 to 13 year old girls in her vehicle traveling over to Monticello for a softball game. And I told her what had happened. We never discussed whether or not it was going to be reported publicly at church, but I'm sure she hoped that I would never utter it to another human being. It really didn't surprise her that I had done something so ridiculous. It's just kind of become a part of what she's had to be used to in being married to me. Now the reason I went through all of those different thought processes is because each one of us in any given moment has got this fast ticker tape reel going through our head of all the things that we've got to do, all the things that we haven't gotten done, all the things, and then worries come in. They come in from everywhere. All these different doubts and, and what am I going to do next? At any given moment, can any of you remember the last time you quieted your mind down? and focused on only one thing. It's actually a very, very difficult thing to do, to be able to block out other thoughts and just focus on one thing, let alone to just focus your time with God without those thoughts being infected from all the other ones coming in from every angle that you got. Some call it the rat race. Some call it lack of focus, lack of mental discipline, whatever it is. It's life. It's what we're all used to. But I want to kind of call it out this morning and call it what it is because we all do this. And what happened to me this past Thursday is I let the rat race of life get to running so fast through my head that I was blinded as to what even deck I was on in the, in the parking garage. I was certain I was in the right place. And do you know why? Because all levels of a parking deck look the same. Except this one didn't have my truck on it. That was the only difference. They're all laid out exactly the same. The door comes out and the view is the same. Well, you know, now that I think about it, it's not. This is how blind I was. I have to park my truck on the first level because it's high enough so that I won't crash my roof into the rafters that are above. Why well, I don't go up any higher. Which means the actual entrance gate with the office that has the parking attendant person and these big bays going out to sunlight are actually right to my left as I'm going to my truck. I didn't even notice that that wasn't there. Didn't even notice it. John is describing the story of a man who was blinded ever since he was born. And I see some, personally see some symbolism 
on how Jesus performed that miracle. Because you see, just as years ago I got the opportunity before I had ever preached a sermon or taught a Sunday school class, my first time my Sunday school teacher asked me to do it. And I was half nervous and half so jacked up about it that I was standing in the backyard and we got a little swimming pool back there that was got a million cracks in it. It was built back during the 80s. But because the, the lesson had to do with Moses parting the Red Sea, this was my calling. So I grabbed me a staff and I pretended to be Moses in my backyard getting ready for the Sunday school lesson I was going to give and went to part that sea in my pool. I did this. This is not made up. This is just how much of a fool that I am. And it occurred to me, probably because God was laughing, and said, you know, Chris, it's not your power and it wasn't Moses' power that parted that sea. It was me acting through Moses. If you want to do something powerful, slick, why don't you get me involved with it? And that's when it occurred to me. Also, with the blind man that's in this story, I say story, I mean, this is historical fact. This happened. We've got both the power of God working and we have it happening on this earth through Jesus Christ. And I like the fact that the mud that was used to open the darkness into light came from two places. Jesus touching this earth and the saliva that came from His mouth. The same place that He spoke the Word of God. And He combined those two. And those two together, through the power of God on this man's eyes, opened the darkness and put him into light. Now, I haven't read anything that confirms the significance of that, but when I read it, that's partly what's significant. You'll see in the, um, the same stories told in the other three Gospels, but John takes a different stance. When John's telling these stories about Jesus performing miracles, he focuses more on the power of God happening. Where the other three are kind of telling it through a version of Jesus' pity, Jesus' compassion, how Jesus felt. They're both correct. But it shows us that you can see the same thing from two different angles, if not more. We can see the same thing through different lenses. But John focuses on the power of God, and that's what's happened. Jesus is... The power of God is in Jesus. He is consumed by it and of it. And that's what's performing the miracle. Now the disciples want to focus on who's to blame for this man's blindness. Back in Jesus' day, there were many different thoughts, but... The, the more prevalent thoughts as regards sin and suffering was first and foremost this, that the two are always together. There's not going to be any suffering. There's got to be some sin tied to it if somebody's suffering. And if that's the case, either this guy did something, but hey, he was born blind, so it must have been his parents. Surely his parents did something to cause this person to be blind at birth. Because you can't Surely you can't sin in the womb. This, just the thought process is to let you know what's going on. Jesus goes right over it and tells them the truth, which is this. This person right here and now was blind so that the power of God can be shown through him and he see again. He focused on God on the real reason. Quit looking at all the sin and suffering and all the, the blaming of why things are the way that they are. 
One thing I've had to learn a hard lesson of as a, as a Christian, and many of you have, and if you haven't, you will, is this. You're going to be persecuted some kind of way. Either for being a Christian or for being something else. You're going to deal with persecution. You're going to deal with rough times. You're going to deal with heartache. You're going to deal with family loss. You're not put in some protective bubble as a Christian and bad things don't happen to you. It's going to happen. So why? Why do bad things happen to good people? Do you know how many people have asked that at a funeral? That's a rhetorical question. Nobody knows that number. But a lot. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why, why are people born blind? What Jesus is telling us is this is going towards the light and the darkness. This is going towards your rough time, your struggle, whatever it is, financial being persecuted, family trouble, whatever you're going through. It's for a reason. It's so God's light can shine in you in that darkness. That's the reason. God doesn't want bad things to happen to you. The world takes care of that. I mean, the world that we know, this rock I'm standing on and the one y'all have set your lawn chairs on and the ways of this world, this is the devil's playground. I mean, we're in his sandbox. And we're his little army man in toys that he wants to play with. But he can't do anything about the power that's from above. He can't do anything about the power of God. When you get out the word of God, Satan's got to go. He's got to leave. The bad stuff of this world are always going to happen. We're born with certain gifts, with certain flaws. There is no perfect person. There was one, and we're not him. Some of us are going to need knee replacement. Some of us are going to need pacemakers. Some of us are going to feel the need they have to go to a diet doctor, and then soon when they leave the office, go to Krispy Kreme Donut. Some of us are going to have problems with our weight. Some of us are going to have problems with our, our wives, with our spouses, with our children. The reason for it is so that the light can shine in the darkness. The man in this story, I don't know if, he's, if, he, if he has a name or if it's somewhere else in the Bible, but the, the blind man in this story, I don't know of his name. His thing was his blindness. We've all got something. We've all got a thorn in our side. And I know we show up, I'm guilty of it too, I know we show up uh, to church sometimes and Oh, Heavenly Father, I can't wait till we can get back to first Sundays in there where we can eat again. But we look around and we see, we see on the outside, you know, happy people, and we get this feeling, and you do it. Why me? Why is everybody else happy? Why is everything perfect in everybody's life around me, and I'm the one dealing with this mess? We think that everybody else has got it made. That ain't true. For anybody, everybody you come in contact with or see, from the President of the United States to the poorest person in Kazakhstan, has some burden they are carrying, has something that's inner tormenting them some kind of way. Everybody. Me included, you included. The purpose of that is for us to let God's light shine into it. Why? To make us feel better? 
Well, perhaps. I, I can't speak for God's reasoning. I can only speak that I believe there is a God and He shines His light through those of us who are Christians. But what I believe is the real reason that light's got to shine in us and through us in tough times is so that those around us can see that that is the highway, that that is the pathway to God. That's what it means to me, and I hope for you to be a Christian, not something that we get and receive, that we become a conduit, that others see what's coming through us and it leads them to God. That's what's supposed to happen with Christianity. Some of us can, can talk it, preach it, sing it, do other things. Every single person can let that light shine through them in their circumstance, in their stature in life so that others see it. That is the most Christian thing that a Christian can do is to be that conduit, let that light shine in the darkness so that others can see it. And in this story with the blind man, it's almost like the story was just hitting us over the head with a hammer. This is a darkness to light. The blind man, Jesus told him what to do. And you know what he did? He did what Jesus told him to do. Which I'm not very good at. Oftentimes, I know what's on my heart to do, and I don't do it. You know those times, you have them. I know you do because, because I do. You know those times that you have where you just feel that little pull or that nudge or that, that warm and fit? You, you see, you're leaving Walmart, and you see this older elderly lady who's trying to get her new Keurig into the back trunk of her car and you know she can't lift it. And you know you can stop. You know you can help. Maybe she even dropped it and shouldn't be bending over that far to pick it up. And then you, you feel that warm feeling. That's the power of God. That is the power of God in you. It's not you. You didn't come up with goodness. You didn't come up with love. God did. That's the power of God. That's proof every single time you feel that nudge that God exists and He is in you. That Jesus is in you. Acknowledge Him. Acknowledge God. And yes, listen and do what He says and help the lady pick up the new curic. But oftentimes we pass up. I don't have time. And the whole time that's happening, you know what's going through my head? Lily's got a ball game at four. Krispy Kreme donuts. Bop, 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 bop. It just keeps going. All the stuff of this world and all the rat race is the blindness that Satan wants to keep our mind's eye cluttered with so we won't let God shine through us. Now I want to finish with this. I'm not in any way, shape, or form political. I, I, I don't watch any, ever, any of the shows, Fox, CNN, whatever they are. I, I, I just, I don't occupy my time with it. I do read and I try to stay abreast so that I know how to, how to vote. But one thing that's permeated beyond those in, in our time, and I feel, someone said to me, earlier this past week and it's a person that is very smart and uh, I know to be a, a, a Christian lady and it, it wasn't my wife um, but we were having a conversation about this and she said you know we as Christians really we got to step up there's nothing about being a Christian that says you should cower or bow down Sometimes you got to stand up. Sometimes you got to stand up straight as a Christian. Sometimes you got to stand your ground as a Christian. And because of that, I wanted to finish 
today with this, and I'll preface it by saying, I'm going in neither direction politically. But if we don't address as Christians, with Christian goggles, the things that are in our lives and on our TV sets, then I, th I think I'm cowering. I want to congratulate Coach Vogel and the Los Angeles Lakers. They clinched their seat in the Western Championship game, Western Conference Championship game, last night. Y'all know I watch LeBron and the Lakers? And y'all know the of the of what's happened in the different states and the Black Lives Matter movement and things like that. And I don't agree or disagree with that particular movement, but the thought occurred to me. God doesn't love me one ounce more than any black, Asian, Hispanic person, nor does He love me any less. And I want, to, I want to finish with this thought. As much as I have seen Black Lives Matter, regardless of where you are on that, I want to tell you today, and if I get persecuted for it, I get persecuted for it. But I believe, I believe one life matters. And it is the life of Jesus Christ. Notice, I didn't say one life mattered in the past tense. One life matters. He is a living Lord and Savior. And if we put Him first, the one life that matters, whether you're white, black, Asian, whatever part of the world, if you put Jesus Christ first, we don't have to worry about the rest of this stuff that's going on. Social injustice. Yeah, it's happening. But where are our priorities? Whether you're on the left or the right, whether you're moderate, wherever you are, one life matters. One life has been the only one that has ever mattered. Jesus talks in the book of John here. He's, he's telling us, you got to work during the day because the night's coming. You only got a few minutes. He's saying right now, you got to do it. When your time is up, your time is up. If you haven't acknowledged the fact that one life matters, and that is the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and you don't get behind it, and you don't humble yourself before Him, your life is wasted. And guess what? I don't care what color, race, nationality, political party you are associated with, if you don't get behind that while you're alive, your life never mattered. It always mattered while you were alive. Jesus wants you. God wants you. Acknowledge Him. Acknowledge Him in your day-to-day -day life when you feel those nudges. And worship Him. Talk to Him. He's listening. But don't do like me and do nothing but talk. Quiet in your mind down. Get this ticker tape of information to slow down enough. Pick some time during the day to not just shut up verbally, but to shut up mentally and let God talk to you and listen. Build that bond. Amen. Now receive this benediction. Father, as we go into our next few days and the next week, before we come back together to fellowship in your name and to get closer to you and to worship you, be with us. Let the words of Scripture that we read and talked about today just be implanted as seeds into our heart, into our souls. Let Jesus go with us. Let his lessons go with us. Let us acknowledge when we feel that warm nudge from you, when we feel that light to take pause 
to cut off the ticker tape of information and questions and worry and doubt flying and racing through our heads. Let us be able to pause it and just rest and bask in that warm nudge of you. Help us slow down. We need your help. We need the help of the Holy Spirit to slow us down mentally. Father, we thank you for what Jesus Christ taught us while he was on this earth. We thank you most of all for that sacrifice he made for us, for his resurrection. And we thank you, Father, for your grace. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.